And I would like to look at a competition model. So again, we're going to have multiple animal species. But these animal species are no longer predator and prey. Instead, these animal species are competing with each other for resources. So like uh, uh, you're looking at some kind of field and you've got foxes and you've got hogs and they're both predators and they're competing with each other for the rabbit observation, something like that. Or you have two prey species. You have two species of fish that are, I guess fish are predators, but you have two species competing for the same grass or the same algae or something like that. And again, let me put these equations on the board piece by piece. Um, in the previous model, we assumed that the prey just had infinite resources, and if it weren't for the predators, it would just grow exponentially. Um, it no longer makes sense to make an assumption like that. Um, we're modeling a situation where we have species competing for finite resources. It doesn't make sense to ignore the resources here. So let's say A1x minus B1x squared. If there were no competition for resources, if we just ignored the other species, we'd have something that looks like this. And you probably haven't committed this to memory because why would you? And also it was like two months ago, but we did look at a population model like this, way back in two point whatever, 2.2 or something. This is the logistic growth. It assumes that there are finitely many resources and um, the population cannot grow to infinity. As time passes, the population will reach its carrying capacity. The correct number of animals given the resource limitations at play. Now we're going to add in a competition term. So this is Again, we have X times Y because competition only can really occur if X, this X species and the Y species are interacting in some way, right? I mean, this is less literal than the Locke Volterra predator prey model. In the predator prey models, interaction was literally there are two species, two animals, and they meet at the same place at the same moment in time, and one of them eats the other. This is less literal, but it's, you know, there's a part of the field, there's some resource. 
crops. There's grass in part of the field, and both the animals are trying to get that resource, and that's an interaction between them. And this is a negative term because this competition is presumably bad for both species. They both want the entire hill of grass, but neither of them is getting what they want because of competition from the other species. And then these equations are very, um, these equations are the same, except, you know, for what we call our variable. Because unlike the predator-prey model, where the two species are fulfilling different roles, here the two species are fulfilling the same role. They're both predators or they're both prey. And once again, we can talk about fixed points. And once again, I'm going to I'm going to move through this at a faster pace, just because we're running kind of low on time. Once again, you can pull a variable out of each of these equations. And once again, you can use the zero product property to find the fixed points. And the zero product property, if we remember that, that sort of that diagram we created last time, the zero product property suggests that you can have four fixed points. And unlike the last, the predator prey model, where there were really only two fixed points, each of these four combinations I've drawn is valid and gives a fixed point. So this competition model has four fixed points. Three of these fixed points involve the extinction of a species. Zero, zero, mutual extinction. Zero, A2 over B2, species A, species X, goes extinct. A1 over B1, zero, species Y goes extinct. And then there's a fixed point that I'm going to call X sub E comma Y sub E. E for equilibrium. And this fixed point occurs, going back to the zero product property, this fixed point comes from this. This fixed point occurs if A1 minus B1X minus C1Y equals zero. And A2 minus B2Y minus C2X equals zero. And the reason we call it X E comma Y E is that solving that differential equation, that 
not differential, solving this system of equations in complete generality would be a hassle. So, um, so we don't do it. We just say we'll call the solution x e comma y. And if we use the Jacobian, these are all isolated. None of these fixed points give um, zero as an eigenvalue. Mutual extinction is an unstable fixed point. So again, you can see how, I mean, you can see how mutual extinction might make sense. They're competing for the same resources. Because of that, there aren't enough resources for anyone and they both go extinct. But that isn't what our model predicts. Our model predicts that these species will not drive themselves to extinction. What this model does say is that two of the extinction fixed points are asymptotically stable. So it could happen in nature that species X wipes out species Y. I mean, just by a competition. Species X eats the food that species Y needs and species Y goes extinct as a result. Or vice versa, species Y might outcompete species X and cause species X to go extinct as a result. This fixed point is more intricate and the textbook doesn't bother going through the details. So I won't bother going through the details either. But the stability of this last fixed point depends on the following. If C1 times C2 is less than B1 times B2, this fixed point is asymptotically stable. If C1, C2 is greater than B1, B2, this fixed point is unstable. And let's try to understand these inequalities because inequalities like this show up a lot in differential equations, and they show up a lot when you're using the Jacobian to try to analyze stability of stuff. Let's ask ourselves, this, these C's and these B's, what are they? So, B1 shows up, that's just the wonder of the whiteboard. I can just scribble out stuff and then erase my scribble later on. Um, B1 was part of the logistic equation we had when um, we were just looking at X by itself and hadn't added in any competition. And B1, you see that negative sign, B1 was a limiting term. B1 was saying, well, there isn't an infinite amount of resources, so um, this population can't grow exponentially. 
So B1 was a competition term, but B1, but not a competition with species Y. B1 was an intra competition term. B1 was acknowledging that there are finite resources and the animals and species X have to compete for those resources. And because of that, competition, they can't grow to infinity. And B2 was playing the same role. B2 is a competition term, not between different species, but within species Y. B2 is saying, Okay, well, species Y is competing for finite resources, even if species X didn't exist, species Y would not be able to grow to infinity. And you see B1 times B2. So B1 times B2 is a measurement of how big B1 and B2 are. And it's a measurement of intraspecies competition. How much species X competes with itself. How much species Y competes with itself. Now C1 and C2 are inter-species competition. They reflect the fact that species X and species Y are competing with each other. So the statement that C1, C2 is bigger then B1, B2 is loosely saying that the competition between the species is important. C1 is measuring competition between the species. C2 is measuring competition between the species. And C1 times C2 is big. So the competition between the species is big. Whereas, again, kind of speaking loosely, C1, B1 being less, sorry, C1, C2 being less than B1, B2 means that competition between the species is not important. So we've got the foxes and we've got the hogs. And theoretically, the foxes and the hogs are both competing for the rabbits. In practice, though, the foxes are mainly competing with the other foxes for the rabbits. And the hawks are mainly competing with the other hawks for the rabbits. They're not really competing with each other. And what we find is that if the competition between species is important, if two species are in fierce competition with each other, coexistence is impossible. The coexistent fixed point is unstable and won't show up in nature.
So this is often summarized as saying that two species cannot fill the same ecological niche. And this, um, historically speaking, this was observed by, I'm blanking on the name, but it was first stated by a Russian biologist based on laboratory observation. And it was then kind of mathematically verified, I guess you could say. That sounds like a very sort of weird way of talking, that mathematics verified the reality that this guy observed. Maybe it, maybe it would be more better to say that the mathematics match up with these observations. Um, I should say, though, with two minutes left, that um, nature is complex. And the competitive exclusion principle is a general statement that is true, except that sometimes it isn't. And nobody's quite sure when it isn't true, why it isn't true. And I mean, the sort of the very famous example of this. is the paradox of the plankton. When you have a bunch of different species or classes or whatever the term is, but you have a bunch of different types of plankton packed together in these very small areas. And they're all competing for the same resources, like the sunlight, the nutrients, and the water, and so forth. And both from mathematics and from laboratory observation, we think that whichever species of the plankton is better at using its resources ought to drive all of the other species extinct. And it doesn't happen. And um, you can find very modern papers, like math and biology papers, like from this year, written by people who are trying to understand and explain why the competitive exclusion principle does not work for these plankton, or why it doesn't work in other situations. So it's not the uh, there are exceptions to it, but it's a general truth. And that brings us both to the end of this section and to the end of uh, the lecture.